I wasn't the one who did this, but I did play a small part, and it was one of the most fulfilling experiences of my life. It was really like something out of a movie. Back in college, I worked at McDonald's flipping burgers to help pay for my tuition. It was not an awful job. All of my co-workers were excellent people. So practically all of my co-workers. There were two workplace bullies, Mia Bully and Oliver Davis. Both of these guys had been at the same location for several years, so they felt entitled to tease and downright undermine new crew members. The rest of us had been around long enough to stand up to these people and tell them to leave us alone. We did our best to defend newcomers who came under Mia and Oliver's anger, but we couldn't always be there for them. Things that the bullies did to new hires included, but are not limited to, walking over and clearing the order screen before newbies had time to see what needed to be made, changing settings on the grills and fryers when newbies weren't looking so that the food didn't cook properly, tampering with the condiment dispensers in various ways, and dirtying the equipment at the end of the shift so that the newbies had to clean it again. Of course, there's the typical name calling and teasing. As you might guess, these antics slowed down drive through traffic and harmed our business. This was brought up repeatedly with the managers, but nothing was done. The goons would occasionally receive a stern but spineless talking to, and that was it. Mia and Oliver had spent their entire careers there. They considered themselves the head cooks or something, and management most likely didn't want to bother hiring new employees, even if a well-trained monkey could perform the job. Many new hires resign after a few days, blaming it on bullying. I cannot say I blame them. However, one new crew member in particular remained despite receiving the brunt of the bully's abuse. We will call him Benjamin. Benjamin was a decent guy who was always polite and easy to deal with, even when Mia and Oliver harassed him. They did, however, manage to reach him on occasion. Following a particularly harsh round of sabotage, I discovered Benjamin sitting on the hood of his car with his head in his hands. The bullies had cleared his order screen several times before he could see it, and several irate customers returned with botched up orders, adding to the stress of drive through times being total rubbish. Benjamin didn't come across as a crying man, but you could see he was barely holding it together. I inquired whether he was okay, and we talked for a few minutes. Benjamin said not to worry, since he was going to have the last laugh with those two, but he didn't specify. We went back inside, and I told the bullies to stop, but they only snickered as usual. Benjamin stayed for around six months, which is a fairly standard tour of duty for a college town, before moving on to pursue other career interests, as he told me. I missed him, and we kept in touch for a while. I eventually transferred to a university in the next town over. That means transferring to another McDonald's as well. At least I'd be free of the goons. Little did I know, revenge was on its way. Fast forward to my final day at that particular McDonald's. I had just arrived for my shift, along with Mia and Oliver. I disliked working with them, but it was my last day. I arrived early, so I sat in the eating room and played on my phone until it was time to clock in. I felt a tap on my shoulder and looked up to see my old friend Benjamin, who surprised me by wearing a manager's uniform. Hello Benjamin, my main dude. Cue the passionate bro hug. Moving up in the world, I see. Benjamin grinned and said that he had been promoted to assistant manager at another store in the company, but had returned to take care of some business. An older man in a full suit stood behind me and Benjamin presented me to his uncle, the franchise owner. Benjamin was the franchise owner's nephew. He was the nephew of the franchise owner the entire time he was doing menial labor and accepting a great deal of asterisk 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 from the thugs. My jawbone tensed and my heart rate increased a couple of notches. I knew SH was about to go down. Benjamin and the owner disappeared behind the counter. I had no idea what had transpired with the goons back there, but I did ask afterwards. When Benjamin told him about all the SH that had been going on, he requested that he stay and maintain a record of everything. 
After seeing Benjamin in a manager's uniform and learning of his relationship with the franchise owner, the thugs collectively pant. They were not only sacked, but they were also facing legal action for all of their pranks. Something about impacting revenues and employee churn. Oliver couldn't stand to look Benjamin in the eyes, so he kept his head lowered like a child. Maya cried and begged for his employment. Benjamin then proceeded to inform them in front of the owner that they were the two most useless people he had ever seen and that, as their superior, he was personally terminating them and prohibiting them from future employment at the company. When I realized this, my justice boner exploded in my pants. Furthermore, Benjamin put in a good word for me with the owner, ensuring that if I ever needed a raise or promotion in my new location, I would most likely get it. I worked at the other McDonald's for eight months, earning an extra $1 per hour before graduating and landing a college-level job. But I never forgot about the bullies and Benjamin. Jude must have had great self-control to show up for work and put up with them, knowing that his uncle would get him a manager's position anyway. Unfortunately, I did not keep up with Benjamin, so I never found out if the bullies were prosecuted, though I like to believe they were. And I like to assume that, as former fry cooks at a fast food restaurant, they were probably unable to pay up, putting them in a situation where they would definitely fit in perfectly. Nora is a good friend of mine. She's a sweet and compassionate mother of two little children. She is also a widow and was an illegal immigrant. She arrived in early 2008 with her husband, a one-year-old daughter, and a second child on the way. He worked enormous hours as a field worker, frequently 60 to 70 hours each week. They had been in this country for about half a year when calamity struck. Her spouse was killed in an automobile accident on his way to work one morning. She did what she needed to do. She landed a job at a local donut store and cafe. She was initially pleased because everyone except the owner was an immigrant, and she shared many interests with her co-workers. And the supervisor assured her she could work long hours, something she truly needed. However, it rapidly became clear that there was a sinister side to this shop. The proprietor would only hire illegal workers. He informed them that if they worked hard for him, he would take care of them. But if they didn't, he would call immigration and have them deported. Then he informed them that they all had to work 48 hours a week and that he did not believe in overtime. He booked them for six days per week, regular time, with no sick or vacation days. She approached me and asked what to do. I informed her that the boss's actions were illegal, that he was breaking Department of Labor standards and that he was relying on her fear to keep her quiet. And she did one of the most courageous things I've ever witnessed. She made the call to DOL, knowing she could be fired and her children deported. Well, the DOL came down and conducted an investigation, discovering that the employer owed his staff more than $27,000 for the time in issue. The boss committed to paying all of his employees overdue wages by an agreed-upon date. This is the paragraph that sentenced him to federal prison. He summons each employee, one at a time, to his office. He gives them a check for the overtime they are owed. It is more than $3,300 per employee. He instructs them to endorse the check since he needs to Xerox it and send it to the DOL. They comply, he duplicates it, and then leans over to run it through the shredder. He warns them all that if they complain to the government, they will all be deported. Now get back to work. And he has the audacity to send those copies to labor. Do you agree that he is completely arrogant? She comes to me crying, saying she needs the money. What can she do now? So I'm the one who drops the dime on Mr. Anderson. The local newspaper had reported that he had agreed to the repayment. So it merely took a few clicks to locate the information I required. I called the department's office in our state capital and was connected to the original investigators. I explained to them what Nora had told me and her concerns about complaining. His audacity shocked them, and they promised to look into it. Normally, the Fed machine grinds slowly, if at all, but this proved too much for the DOL. In under two months, a federal grand jury 
returned a 10-count indictment for concealment by deceit, providing false statements to the United States Department of Labor, and willfully failing to pay overtime to his employees. Boss. It turns out that a conviction for concealment by trick and making false statements carries a maximum punishment of five years in prison, a $250,000 fine or both. A conviction for willful failure to pay overtime carries a maximum punishment of six months in prison, a $10,000 fine or both. The judge sentenced him to five years in prison. I'm not sure if he served the entire sentence, but I bet he'll never do it again. By the end of 2011, Boss was in jail. Mai and her co-workers remained in the Donut Cafe. The boss's wife ran the Donut Cafe, which Nora and her co-workers stayed at. No one was deported. I'm not sure about the others, but Nora became a US citizen in the fall of 2016. She has now remarried, and the children are doing well in school. She now works as a secretary for a nearby corporation, earning significantly more than she did selling donuts. I am quite proud of her. Any pity I had for him vanished when he shredded their overtime checks. I would have liked to have seen him explain his behavior to the judge before he was condemned. He clearly considered these folks subhumans and preyed on that. I hope he wasted the entire five years of his life because he had influence over them. Takes his extended family on a cruise. My father had been with the same employer for nearly 30 years before he was unceremoniously fired for cause. He was organizing an upcoming gathering for people who had to travel from all across the country. One key person unexpectedly resigned, so dad cancelled the meeting via email and explained why. Apparently, that constituted improperly sharing privileged information, and he was fired the following day. All of this happened a week after dad's supervisor retired and a new employee who wanted to cut costs took his place. What a coincidence. This occurred around 10 years ago, at the height of the recession. Dad was in his 50s and had not interviewed for a job since the early 1980s. He was unsure if he'd ever find another job. My mother returned to work at a school to pay the expenses, while my father cobbled together what he could by doing some internet consulting assignments for a virtually minimum income. They managed to keep their heads above water, just barely. Dad has been out of work for a year and a half. He ultimately got a position at a new company three states away, which happened to be approximately an hour away from where my wife and I lived. They were also expecting Dad's first grandchild. Mum and Dad moved around 20 minutes away from us. They had paid off the mortgage on their home, so they decided to maintain it and rent it out, hoping to retire there in a few years. The new company treated Dad incredibly well, paid him more than his previous employer, provided good benefits, and treated him with respect by both his co-workers and superiors. A year later, Mum and Dad were able to purchase a second, smaller home near their grandchildren. Dad told his new bosses a few things about his stint at the previous company, nothing private, just general strengths and faults. Of course, the fact that he was fired became public. It turns out that when you work for a firm for more than 25 years, you learn a few things about how it works, and lowering expenses by eliminating experienced staff can leave your organization exposed. The new companies became quite fascinating. They saw a vital commercial opportunity, as well as an opportunity to advocate for a valued colleague. A few years later, the new corporation acquired the old company. They were both large corporations, and mergers of this magnitude take time. But when the dust settled, it was obvious that there were redundancies. Divisions in items that both companies possessed, but the new company only needs one of them. They retained as many of the former company's employees as possible, and relatively few lost their positions, except for the folks who fired Dad. The new firm put Dad in charge of the building where he used to work at the old company and allowed him to hire personnel from both the old and new companies. Dad had to return to his home state, so the new firm assisted him in selling his new home and provided him with a $1,000 moving stipend. But mom and dad had just moved back into their own home. 
They made a big profit when they sold their new property, which they had been paying for and improving for five years. They used that money, together with the moving allowance, to pay off bills, prepare for retirement, and go on a cruise with me, my siblings, our spouses, and grandchildren. Because it's Christmas, and I've never heard precisely what transpired when the individual who terminated my father was laid off, I can simply inquire with him. Dad would not say. 